Yep. Pedro from the MPRX. I'm here today with Daniel from Bodum After Midnight to talk about Paint the Sky with Blood out April 23rd on Napalm Records. How are you doing? Doing all right. Thanks for asking. Good to be here. Is this a little bit sweet for you to finally see these songs come out to the masses and, and the fans be able to hear them, but at the same time with everything that surrounds this release, do you, do you feel like there's a little bit of bittersweetness to it? Well, yeah, there's actually a lot of bittersweetness. So, yeah, you're right. But um, it is what it is. We can, you know, change the past, but we wanted to get these songs out because Alexi wanted that too. So, yeah, we wanted to fulfill his wish. Well, when, when you listen to the three tracks on the EP, uh, how close of a picture will the fans get of what the full length album would have sounded like? Probably very, very close to what that, what that song sounds. So, but yeah, it's obviously impossible to say exactly because there was no more songs written. So, yeah. So there's nothing in the vault. Oh, right. There's nothing in the vault. There's not like no little bits and pieces that later on you guys could like, kind of tie them all together with super glue and, and 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 have some extra tracks down the line. This is it. No, that was pretty much all. I mean, that was all. All the songs, all the riffs Alexi ever presented us. So there's no leftovers. Uh, uh, looking back and at when Bodum After Midnight got started and you guys start working on this project, uh, how would you define the energy that Alexi had at that time, leaving Children of Bodum with you and then starting this band? How, how was his spirit and energy going into this? He, will, he was actually very excited and uh, he often told us that uh, he feels like, a, and he told to the media as well, that he feels like 20 years younger now. Uh, because of this new group, I guess. But uh, yeah, he was very excited and uh, eager to show, show to the world that he still got this, you know, he was top of his game. How did you feel about it when, when he approached you uh, about getting Bodum After Midnight, uh, having it going and, and continue the legacy that he had started with Children of Bodum? Um... Well, obviously, I was uh, very happy that he wanted to continue with me. And uh, yeah, that was also a little bit bittersweet because COB quit. And that wasn't the plan, obviously. But uh, yeah, still, I, I knew that we were going to continue together. So that gave me something to, something to look forward. So yeah. Uh, working all these years with, with him, how much of his playing style and, and, and the way he approached music in general have rubbed off on you? A lot, uh, especially when I was younger and uh, that was time around the Hate Breeder and Follow the Reaper came out. Those albums, you know, influenced me a lot and my playing and my songwriting and etc. cetera. But uh, yeah, and he was he was the guy who raised the bar in Finland and show what you can actually do with guitar and songwriting and yeah he influenced a lot one thing is for you to be at home or or somewhere and listen to one of his songs like you mentioned the the hate breeder era the other thing is for you to be on stage with him seeing him night in and night out coming out performing singing playing guitar i mean those two things, considering how good of a guitar player he was and singing at the same time, that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, were you in awe sometimes uh, being there next to him performing uh, every single night on a tour with the things that he did? Uh, what was the question? Sorry. The, you... One thing is for you to listen to his music, but once you're actually on stage with him and you're part of the band and you're and, and you guys are working together, that, that gives you a different perception that perhaps when you're on the outside of the band, you don't have. Yeah. How, 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 did, how did you feel about it? Like, did you sometimes were amazed by how incredible he was in terms of being able to sing, play guitar, do everything that he did on stage? Yeah. Right now? Yeah. yeah, that ha happened quite many times because uh, when you really work with him, you got to see 
from a very close distance how good he actually was. It's it's a little bit different than you know just listen to his records and his playing from the record than actually see him, you know, from a couple meters distance how he does things and how he approaches things. So yeah, he amazed me quite a many times. <laughs> Uh, getting deeper into this EP, uh, "Paint the Sky with Blood," the the first song, the opening track, it, it's it's an amazing opening track. Now, do you think if you guys had gone down the road and we were able to release a full length album, was this still going to be the opening track? Because to me, it has all the the right tools in order to be this incredible just opener for an album or even for a concert. It could have been, but. I can't say for sure. <laughs> there could have been an even better opener. Who knows? You know? Yeah, yeah, it's it's hard to, to say. But definitely, uh, this would be one of the options. Yeah. With, with pay, Payback's a Bitch, I love that section there in the middle where you have the guitar solo, the keyboard, and then the guitar solo, which is something like really classic uh, COB mm -hmm. style approach. H how did that song come together in, in terms of creating that section there, but the overall construction of the track? Pretty much in the same way that Paint the Sky with Blood and same way that I actually worked him with Hex Session. So he's a very, Alex is very spontaneous writer. He doesn't like think much ahead or overthink it. He just, you know, comes with a riffs or a melody and we just put them together. And then maybe we should, maybe we tried something different arrangement options but um sometimes we were like uh disagreeing that sh this should be chorus no this should be verse and but then we always find a, a middle yeah was the, was the creative process in, in bottom after midnight a democratic one like did you guys all have a little bit of an input in terms of how the final product would end up being mm, well yes and no um I like to wrote the music, so, but we really, we never disagreed on that kind of stuff, you know. We never, never, you know, none of us ever thought that this riff isn't good enough or something. So there was really not much to vote or arguing or whatsoever. But uh, when we arranged these songs, he listened to everybody, what they had to say and uh, Everybody got to say what they think. And uh, usually he was very uh, open to our ideas. And uh, he, he most of the, probably nine out of 10 times he took it, took them. So yeah, I'd say it, it was very, not democratic, but fair. Mm -hmm. do, do you feel that Bodom After Midnight, from a musical perspective, was this gonna be a continuation of what you guys had done with Bodum, or, or was there a need or a feel that you guys wanted to change something to, in order to separate the two worlds? Um, I'd say like a 70% continuation and 30%, <laughs> maybe a little changes here and there. Well, let's say 80 and 20. But uh, yeah, he, the only thing he really wanted to change or uh, or cut down was the keyboard solos. That was the only only thing we ever like discussed discussed about. So he wanted to have like two lead guitar players and a, a little bit less keyboard solos. So, but the, even though there is a one. On the uh, by the way, who who did the keyboards on on the record? Uh, the guy's called Billy Itapelto. He's playing. He's playing. Uh, band called Treystone. I don't know if you're familiar of that. And I'm not sure if they're, they probably won't, don't exist anymore. And he, he has like a, many other, other projects as well. And uh, I think he did keys on Esa Holopainen's new solo album, Silver Lake. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he's a busy guy. Yeah, sounds like it. He, he, did, did, an amazing, he, he did an amazing job on, on Paint the Sky with Blood. Yes, he did. And probably that's one of the reasons that it sounds a little bit different to COB because he used use like a different sounds, slightly different sounds that Janne would picked up perhaps. 
So that that's the one thing that makes sense. Yeah, I, I felt that listening to the EP, when, when I started listening to it and I went through it, I felt that there was obviously a lot of COB in there, but you guys were packaging it in a different way. And I, and I mm -hmm. felt, and I want to get your input on this because you know Alexi way better than most of us that are watching this interview right now. Uh, I, I felt that this work that you guys are putting together on this EP really showcases uh, greatness. This is perhaps some of his best work I don't know, in the last 10 years or something. It's really incredible. It's almost like he rediscovered the fountain of youth when, when you guys got together for Bodom After Midnight. Do you, do you feel that way about these tracks as well? Yeah, I think in this track he was, or these tracks, he was on top of his game and probably one of his best work. And yeah, yeah, it's, I don't know what to say really, what else to say? Yeah, it's a little bit comes in a different package, like you said. Like there's a little bit, you know, input from everybody, and obviously there's a lot of different uh, new players, <laughs> which affects a lot. Even though if one guy writes the material, the core material, it's still, funny. it's funny you say that because I thought one of the the two of the biggest changes for me, at least listening to it, was definitely with the keyboards, but the other one is with the drums. I felt mm -hmm. the drums were uh, uh, had a lot more presence. They create like on these tracks, you feel like they have a much stronger bass presence. They're really the foundation of the tracks that allows the two of you on the guitars to be as dynamic, as fluid as you guys want to be. You don't really have to worry about creating a lot of heaviness because the drums are giving you that bass line. Do you, do you feel that way about the drums on this record as well? Yeah, I mean, Walter is a he's a killer drummer and he just killed it. You know, he's a guy who doesn't need any instructions, you know. You just show him the riff and you're good to go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You just let him do his thing. Yeah. I don't, I don't really recall that we had to tell him like anything, except we suggested that there should be this kind of beat here and uh, try something. And usually it works like a charm. Yeah, he doesn't need a lot of direction. No, not at all. He's like super talented. He picks every guitar accent and riff and you don't have to worry about that at all, you know. Yeah, and, and I think it really helped you guys because overall this album, well, not this album, the CP, these three tracks feel a lot more alive. They feel like they have a lot more energy. They have a lot more depth. It, it, you know, you can listen to them and they feel simple. But when you really sit down and you try to break them down, the songs are not simple at all. They have a lot of different layers to them. And I think that's mm -hmm. an assessment to who you guys surrounded yourselves with for Bodom After Midnight. Yeah, exactly. They have a lot of energy and uh, probably big, big reason behind that is the two new guys, you know. They actually like, you know, seeing Valtteri playing drums or Mitya playing bass, bass uh, that actually like push, pushes me and Alexi to play even, even or try even harder. Not, I don't know if we play any better, but even try it, play better. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. Who, who brought the idea to do the dissection cover uh, as, as part of, of Bottom After Midnight? I, I thought you guys nailed it, but who, whose idea was it? Uh, that was actually Walter's idea initially, which is funny because he's the youngster and it's still <laughs> an important band to him. I, I thought it was going to be you. I, I thought the answer was going to be you. <laughs> well, uh, I probably I, I would have wanted to do that, but um, it's some of the it's one of those songs that you are a little bit afraid to touch because it's so iconic song, and you don't want to fuck that up. Uh, and the original is already so damn good that uh, you can easily fuck that up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then again, we just um, thought about it even more and. Uh, we saw a challenge there. Um, so why don't we like, a, instead of taking some uh, goofy tune with COB obviously did, a, you know, many, many times we didn't want to go that road. We wanted to take a like serious song and try to make it even, even improve it if possible, at least add a little bit different flavor to it. And uh, we have a, uh, 
keyboards on it, on it, which the original don't have. So even so, that that makes a little bit different sounding, of course, the modern production and Alex's vocals, which he nailed it. Do, do you feel like this is a cover that for the new metalhead that perhaps never heard the original, when they listen to this, they think it's one of yours? Um, I don't know. <laughs> if they read the booklet, then they probably realize that it's not it's ours. Not. But it could be. I, the funny thing is that when I listen to that song, it could be like, it feels like a original bottom song. Because it, it, it has like same elements that uh, the slow songs that Alexi has written in the past. And obviously dissection has been a huge influence to him. Like it's been to me too. Going forward, what, what does the future hold for you, Daniel? Well, um, I really haven't think about that, been able to think about that. Um, we're planning things ahead a lot, but um, let's see. I have a one project which I've been working for a while, but uh, who knows? There might be some something else. I'm like very open to any ideas in the future, but uh, the door is open. No, it's it's difficult to say what's going to happen. I have one last question for you, and that is during this moment that you guys are releasing this EP, it's, it's a way of celebrating uh, what you guys have done. It's a way of celebrating Alexi's memory. Uh, how do you think you see going forward, what's the best way to honor his legacy? That, that's a question I don't totally get. I don't know. What's the best way to honor his legacy? Mm. I don't know if there's like best way to honor his legacy and what would be that. I don't know, to be honest. Just listen to his music, I guess. Yeah, listen to his music and uh, remember him as, as a great musician he was. I don't know anything else, you know. I think that's good. I, I'll, yeah. I'll do that. I'll, I'll take you <laughs> and I'll do that. Me too, yeah. <laughs> All right, Daniel. Thank, thank you very much for your time today, man. I really appreciate it. I know you guys are super busy. All the best of luck with this EP release. I think you guys are going to uh, hit the ground running. Uh, fans are going to love it. And this is a nice way to uh, honor, in part, his, his legacy and his memory. So thank you for releasing it. And uh, thank you for taking the time to chat with me about it. Hey, thanks for having me. It was fun. Thank you. Fun to be here, Anna. You have a good day there. You too. Take care. See you.